Hi. Um, okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another session of the Network Seminar Series hosted by the Center for Networked Intelligence at the ECE and the RBCCPS IASC. Uh, today's talk is by Professor Sanjay Shakote, and he will be speaking on the power of adaptivity in representation learning from meta learning to federated learning. Dr. Sanjay Shakote received his PhD from the ECE department at the University of Illinois at the Urbana Champaign in 2002. He is with the University of Texas at Austin, where he is a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and holds the Cockerell Family Chair in Engineering. He received the NSF Career Award in 2004 and was elected as an IEEE Fellow in 2014. He was a co-recipient of the IEEE Communication Society William R. Bennett Prize in 2021. He is currently the Editor-in-Chief of the IEEE ACM Transactions on ne Networking. His research interests lie at the intersection of algorithms for resource allocation, statistical learning and networks with applications to wireless communication networks and online platforms. Before we move on to the talk, we request the online audience to keep your microphones on silent for the duration of the talk, except when asking questions. And for questions, you may unmute yourself and ask Professor Sanjay directly or type them in the chat box and we will relay your questions. Um, over to you, Professor Sanjay. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, um, I'm really honored to speak at this venue. So, um, so what I'm going to do is to, uh, uh, can you see my screen? I'm sharing the screen. Is this uh, coming through clearly? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So uh, yeah, um, please feel free to stop me at any time or interrupt me during the talk uh, anytime. I'd be happy to answer questions. So I'm going to be talking about uh, power of adaptivity and representation learning. And this is, uh, this is based on several collaborators. Um, the lead author on this is Liam Collins, who's a graduate student here at UT. Um, and this, so it's going to consist of sort of two parts. Both parts are collaborative with uh, Prof. Aryan Mokhtari, who's my colleague here. And one part is with, uh, uh, with uh, my, uh, my colleague from UPenn, Hamid Hassani. And the other part with my colleague from University of Washington, Professor Sebumu. So with this uh, background, uh, so I'd like to acknowledge all these collaborators and let's get going with the talk itself. So <clears throat> I want to start with an overview of uh, few shot learning and then actually get into the technical details. So one of the central goals in machine learning is to generalize to new tasks. What do we mean by that? Let's say that there is uh, there is some object we want to identify in various scenarios. Okay, and there's this drone drone that's taking those images. So let's say it's a human on the ground. Okay, um, so maybe you have a few images of uh, that per particular human in uh, sort of this kind of a setting, you know, a seashore kind of thing. Um, maybe you have again some not too many, but some images from a desert and from a mountain background and so on. Okay, so you have a collection of images from various scenarios. Uh, but what you really care about is to try to identify that person maybe in a completely new setting, maybe on a lakeside or something like that. Yes, it's related to the same kind of person, but the backgrounds are very different. So this is just an exemplar of the kinds of problems that, are, uh, that we care about. That is, you've got training data from various scenarios, but the goal is to quickly adapt to the task in a new scenario. You can talk, think about this problem in various types of settings. Today, I'm going to be talking about the setting of few shot learning. The few shot setting learning is that in aggregate, we have large amount of data from many training environments. The example you saw, these are the many training uh, settings. Uh, in each setting, you may have a few images, not too many, uh, but in aggregate or all of them, you have a large number of images. And more and importantly, you have a small amount of data prior to deploy, uh, prior, just available prior to deployment from the deployment scenario. Meaning when you come to the scenario, you, you're not expected to make decisions cold, meaning with, uh, with no additional information. You're given a few images from this new scenario. The few images are not enough, say, for training a new model from scratch, but potentially you can fine tune the model. Okay. So there are, there are sort of, uh, so the one, this approach would be, you build a model using data from all these training environments. You've got a lot of data. And then fine tune this model, meaning you know, a few, few iterations of SGD or a few batches of SGD. 
um, to on the model that you already trained to sort of fine tune it for this deployment environment. Okay, so that's the setting we are interested in, and this is sort sort of called few shot learning. So the amount of data you may have may be as small as you know like five or ten images or something like that. The question is, how do you build a model that is easily fine tunable? And so the obvious approach for building a model that's easily fine tunable is to um, minimize average. You don't care whether you're going to fine tune or not. Look at all this data, build a model. And then when you come to this deployment environment, you just fine tune this model. So let's talk about this approach. <clears throat> so here's a cartoon illustration of what we mean by that. You've got... So I'm going to use the word tasks and environments interchangeably. You've got a collection of tasks. So here, task one is this one. Um, you want to, in this, this some background colored hand uh, digits. So zero to nine with some font. Okay. Task two is again, identifying among zero to nine. The font is different. The background is different. Handwriting is different and so on. So I've got a collection of many, I've got a bunch of tasks. And in each task, I have some images. I don't have too many, yeah, some small number of images. But in aggregate across all of them, I have a large number of images. So each task has its has a loss function associated with the equivalently. Um, so what you what what you do for this thing? Well, you got all these tasks. So you would want to minimize average loss. So if I find the loss function for the ith task and theta is the model parameter, okay, then what would you do? You would just try to look at the average loss and find a model that minimizes the average loss. So this is the model I got from training. Then in the test stage, when you're actually deploying, now you start with this model you have learned here okay? and you want to fine tune it. So you basically maybe take this model and take it one or two, maybe let's say just one, uh, you just have even one sample, then you just take one gradient step um, or one is stochastic gradient, or one gradient step to take this model and fine tune it for the task at hand. What do I mean by I have a little bit of data? So say this is the new task. So it's a different handwriting from anything you've seen before. So maybe I give you one or maybe a couple of images from this task. So whatever model I have at this point, I take that and then you do a couple of gradient steps or in this example, just even one gradient step to get a new model, theta star new. And then you use this new model and evaluate performance on this. Is the setting clear? I just want to make sure that uh, that this fine tuning setting is clear to anyone. If you, uh, if it's not, please stop me at any time. I'm happy to talk more. Okay, <clears throat> this is the general this is the general way you would fine tune a model. Does this work well? So we'll call this the average risk minimization plus fine tuning. So let's look at this following example problem. Right, you have images from a large number of classes. Say you got ImageNet with. Uh, um, many, many class of images. Task one is the following. I pick three of these uh, classes, dog, deer, and for frogs. Then from this task, task one, I need to do a three-way classification problem. I need to identify whether it's a dog, deer, or frog. Task two is a different set of types of images from the, uh, from the group, bird, horse, or cat. And again, I need to decide among these three what's the right thing to do, and so on. So these are all different tasks. The classification is the classification problem is different, but you see that they're all dealing with sort of natural images taken from a much larger class of images. So going back to the previous approach, what would we do? Okay. Um, taking all these different tasks, these tasks correspond to sort of all these things here. Okay. You train a model, and then once you train a model, you want to test it. So, um, but before test, when you are deploying. You can fine tune the model. So maybe during test time, I give you three a new task consisting of three classes. Maybe it has cats, um, horses, and maybe antelopes or something like that. And so what I would do is take a few images from that, fine tune the model, and test it. And what was observed, and this is from the paper by uh, uh, Chelsea Finn et al. in 2017, was that this doesn't work very well. So if you fine tune, you take a bay, you you do this. We, you train such a train a model, but then when you fine tune it, review samples straight away, then the performance is not very good. But and you can do much better than that, which is what their observation was. And these uh, these figures are to sort of show that ARM plus fine tuning has mixed performance. 
So this does not work very well. And so in, researchers have sort of looked at two different ways of dealing with this fine tuning problem or a few short learning problem. The first is I don't use this loss function fi, which is associated with each task, but modify this loss function in some way. And that's what I'm going to talk about first, which will lead to sort of mammal. The other way is, is, uh, is a very different approach. Suppose you can just train, change the training procedure itself. Okay? Um, then again, it turns out that if this uh, changing the training procedure plus fine tuning works very well. It's somewhat a little more mysterious, and we'll talk about that in the second part of this talk. Okay, but let's first get to the first part, changing the loss function, which is a mammal approach. So mammal or model agnostic meta learning was proposed by Finn, Abil, and Levine in 2017. Uh, it's a very well-known piece of work. So I'm going to just summarize uh, their idea here. Okay, so go back to our previous figure. We had a bunch of tasks, and we needed to find a model. Previously, we said that the, mo the, the model would be trained using the loss function associated with each task. But what is really going on? You, are, you train a model and you know that you're going to deploy it after fine tuning, meaning when you're coming to a new environment, you can take this model, take a, take a gradient step to get a, a model that is better fitted for this particular task, and then test the performance on that new model. So if you're anyway going to fine tune the model, then you may say, hey, let the, the, model, the model that's being evaluated is a fine tuned version of the model, not the original model itself. Meaning, let's start with this particular task. The last loss one, suppose that I, start, I have a model theta that the system gives you, okay? Then, and suppose this task itself appeared for, uh, as they uh, in the next stage, what would you do? You take this model and fine tune it for this particular model in this stage. So I would take some gradient step for that, and this would be the model I use. So if I so since I'm going to fine tune it anyway, the mammal objective says instead of just evaluating fi of theta in the loss function, I'm going to use the fine tune model for that task in the evaluation stage. Meaning, so the model theta should be fine-tuned for that particular task by taking a gradient test, a gradient step with respect to that particular task. So this is the new theta i, as it were, the model for which is fine-tuned for task i. And then you should evaluate the loss for that. That's really what's going on. So the loss function is taking into account that it's not going, the model is not going to be used directly. It's going to be fine-tuned for a task. And you train a model, using this new loss function. In the test time, do exactly what you did previously, meaning take whatever model this gives you, fine tune it, and test the performance. And Finn et al. observed, as we saw, that these models have tremendously better performance than sort of the basic model. All right, so this is a summary of what the mammal approaches. And this this mammal model learns more, uh, can quickly solve new tasks has been studied by the original authors as well as several follow-ups in image classification regression reinforcement learning and so on but what was surprising is that mammal seems to learn a representation that's shared across tasks and this was observed by uh, this particular paper which is uh, ragu ragu benji and vinyas in 2020 even though it's not designed for representation learning what do we mean by representation learning? Well, here's the following. So suppose the model is a neural network. Okay? Um, so the x-axis in this figure is the uh, corresponds to the layer of the neural network. This is the first layer, this is the second layer, and head basically is the last layer. Okay? So I will use the word head for the last layer and body for all the inner layers. In the y-axis is, is a similarity score of the neural network before and after fine tuning. Meaning, you in this stage, some model is you come up with a model at this point. Then here you fine tune the model. That's what the new model you get at this point is. So I want to compare this model here versus the model here. That's what is going on here. So you take a model, you fine tune it, and see how much the model changed. And what they realized is that the early layers of the neural network does not change very much. So a score here 
is high if there is no change and the score is low if there's a lot of change. So the early layers have very limited change, whereas the last layers seems to change a lot. The interpretation of this statement is that, hey, the model's body is not changing very much. What is really happening is only the last layer, the classification layer um, or the head is being, when, when you give new data, only that part is being changed significantly. Meaning the body is essentially captured uh, something inherent about the images itself, um, aka the representation. Yeah. So this is what was an empirical observation. So our goal in this first part of the talk is to figure out, um, can, can we actually explain this, um, why representation learning is happening? And to do that, we are going to take the simplest uh, problem, uh, which is multitask linear regression. So this is something we understand well, and we know we have a lot of algorithms for this. Let us see what MAML would do when faced in a multitask linear regression. So we are going to use this as a vehicle to understand MAML in this part of this talk. So what is the multitask linear regression problem? Well, it's um, so you got feature vectors X. You got some model theta star. You got a label, which is nothing but theta star transpose X. So this is just a standard linear regression. There's additive Gaussian noise, zero mean noise, which is added to this. And the goal is you're given, you're given samples X comma Y, and you need to learn theta star. This is just classic regression, and we know how to solve this. Okay. In the multitask linear regression problem, you're not just given one task, you're given many tasks. So if you suppose that these vectors lie in RD, some D-dimensional space, well, in the, if you had just single task, then you would require order D number of samples to sort of find the correct model. In the multitask linear regression problem, if the tasks are all completely uh, unrelated to each other, you can solve each task at a time and require D samples per task. For, however, in the multitask linear regression, you're saying that these tasks are somehow related to each other. And what do we mean by related to each other? So all these, the models lie in a shared k-dimensional subspace. Okay. So uh, concretely, what does this mean? That there is some low dimensional subspace of rank uh, of size k, which is much, much smaller than the ambient dimension. Each, there's a generative model for each theta star that for each task, the model parameters, which is the following. You, you look, look within that subspace, Okay, this is the B star, this way, the, the subspace is uh, defined by the columns of B star. And there's some weight vector within that subspace. So it's a much lower dimensional weight vector. And theta star is generated by essentially taking this weight vector and lifting it up to the ambient space through this from B star. Okay. So what, where are we at this point? We are looking at a multitask linear regression where all the tasks are related in the sense that they all lie in a subspace. And you get the task vector in the higher dimensional ambient space simply by lifting it up um, to, to the ambient space through this uh, through the column space of B star. Now, if you are in this multitask linear regression setting, then what can we do? Excuse me. Yeah, the lights go off automatically if I don't move. Um, so yeah. So if you are in this uh, multitask linear regression setting, then if you know the if you knew the column state of B star, then you really you see that for each one of these things which lie in the ambient dimension of D, you don't need D parameters. You need you need only K parameters to describe it because you already know B star. If I if I told you this B star, you just need to learn this W star I, which is a much which is just a K dimensional vector. K is much smaller than D, and so once you know the column space of B star. It just requires order k number of samples, which is much smaller than order d. And hopefully you can learn B star very well by because you've got if you've got a large enough number of tasks, it's not just one task, say i equal to one, two, you've got a large number of tasks, you can amortize the learning of this across these tasks and essentially learn things in of order of k samples into order d samples amortized per task. So this is just multitask linear regression. Um, there are many, many ways to solve this. You don't need mammal or any such thing. Um, you can just solve some other types of least square problems, some alternating algorithms, many ways of day of doing this. Okay. So the goal today is not 
trying to find a new algorithm to solve this multitask linear regression problem. The goal is, if mammal is faced with this, what happens? And can we use this to try to understand why mammal is quote, learning representations compared to yeah, the, the, pre, the baseline we considered previously? Um, let me pause for a second. Um, is there any questions at this point? So I've essentially talked about the problem we want to solve in the first part. Just want to make sure that there are no questions here. So just uh, one uh, small one small question. Yeah. So here, essentially, it is capturing the relation between the different uh, models, right? Um, this relation. Um, if, if I translate this to in terms of, let's say, in reinforcement learning, you have some uh, relation between the rewards of different tasks. Uh, so let's That's say the rewards are related. So is it along the similar lines or is it completely different? Yeah, there are, you can capture relations in many ways. Concretely, what if you are using a, a neural network for decision making in the example you talked about? It basic this basically says that's a linear network that there is no there is no sigmoid or any uh, or relu or any such thing. Okay, and this is the body of the network. It's a one layer body, and this is the head. And it's saying that all the tasks are such that the body is the same for every one of them. The head is different for each one of them. Okay. Okay. Okay, so that's that's so it's it it could potentially you could translate that to a, uh, to the rewards as you said, but concretely this is exactly what it means that the decision making body is exactly the same for everything the ground truth, and uh, all that is different is the weights of the last layer. So the, this has been that that's all this thing means. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So. Again, there are many ways to, as I said, this solving this problem is not a hard one. There, I mean, there, we very we understand how to solve multitask linear regression using many ways. The goal right now is to see what happens when we give mammal tools. Okay, so in, in this case, it's multitask. So what's the loss function for each task? The loss function for each task is um you want so you want to find a so each task. There's a particular body and a W. So the theta you get associated with B and W is just this theta. You want to solve this least squares problem. That's the task for the ith task. The ith task is given by xi comma y y. And let's look at the population version. I've written sort of sample version of it, but I really don't want to talk about the finite sample version of it. Let's just think about the population version. So remember the mammal loss function. It says start with the model, fine tune the model. Look at the fine-tuned model, compare the look at the loss of the fine-tuned model, and then average over all tasks. That's the mammal. So you've got sort of a gradient. First, there's an inner step. This is what is called the inner step. This is a per task personalization, as it were. And then there's an outer step where you're evaluating the model itself. Okay. So let's say that the end tasks satisfy some nice di uh, reasonable diversity condition. What's the diversity condition? The diversity condition is that I've got a bunch of tasks, all of them lying in some low dimensional subspace. I want to make sure that those tasks span essentially that subspace so that, that I have enough information from these tasks to learn the subspace well. So this is the natural diversity condition. So um, the inner loop in MAML would be to, if you have, in the, when you're learning, you have the model W and B. So presumably you're learning this iteratively. And so in any iteration, you've got a model at time t, at iteration t, w, t, b, t. And you need to update that model. So in the inner step, um, each task i updates the model by taking a task-specific gradient step. So this b, t, i, and w, t, i, it's just an, ad local, it's just an adaptation of the, ta of the model for that particular task. Once you have that, you need to evaluate, you need to update the global model, so the outside one. So, which means I need to take a gradient of, I need to do gradient descent on this total summation. And if you do that outer step as well, because there's a inner gradient, Hessian and something comes out, but I don't want to get in, but you can figure this out uh, offline. It's, that's not important. The important thing is you get, there's an inner loop adaptation and there's an outer loop update by gradient descent. And these are the equations that come out of it. Now, there are many variants of mammal people have looked at. 
Um, in the in the in the inner loop, for example, we adapted the, the each task adapts quote unquote the head and the body. Suppose you say, hey, I'm not going to adapt the body at all. I will just keep the body the same. I'll simply adapt only the head. This algorithm is called ANIL, almost no inner loop. Again, proposed by uh, the uh, Rogu et al. paper. Um, and then you can say, hey, there's a Hessian here. I'm going to ignore it. I'll just drop this term arbitrarily, um, second order terms. Then I'll get some other approximation. This is called first order ANIL. So there, there are all these kinds of any, uh, variants that you can think of, but they all share the same property that there's an inner loop adaptation of the model and an outer loop gradient step. Okay. So it's a, this two step. And what, so let's look at all any of these algorithms with the inner and the outer versus sort of the base case we studied at the beginning, which is that you don't do any adaptation. You just uh, do average risk minimization and, and then, um, fine tune the model later. Turns out there's a surprising difference in behavior. In this plot is the number of, uh, as the model is getting trained, this is the number of iterations. And the y-axis is essentially the distance between the BT, the, the representation that has been learned at, at, at iteration T versus B star, which is the real ground truth representation. Remember we are planted a B star because all our tasks are essentially taken from this low dimensional subspace, uh, this subspace, we can think of this as a planted model. And now we can ask, how far away is these subspaces? And there's a way of measuring subspace uh, through something called principal angular distance, which generalizes essentially the notion that uh, two vectors are aligned or not. These are two high, two subspaces are they aligned or not. Okay? And the distance goes to zero is the subspaces become, the column spaces become aligned. And so if you look at the base algorithm, where the loss function is unmodified, then essentially the distance between BT, the learned, more, learned uh, representation at time T versus B star does not change. This is this figure. It is, uh, it is, the loss isn't going down. Whereas for any of these algorithms, MAML and its variants, things are going, these are log plot. So things are exponentially going down the distance. So which means essentially that meta learning approaches learn the column space of B star while the standard average risk minimization or empirical risk minimization does not. And this is again a, a, another, this is another example to again say that um, what, this, what the Raghu et al. observed previously that MAML seems to learn empiric, uh, representations in, uh, in practice, this is sort of showing that even in this least course, in this linear representation setting, you got not just learning the representation, learning the representation, but actually learning it geometrically fast. The question is, why is this happening? Okay. So, meaning, despite all this empirical uh, evidence, it's not clear why it's happening, and there is there was no existing theory to actually understand why this is happening. So, that's that's sort of the first contribution here to try to to explain why MAML and ANIL are actually learning representations. So first, let me state the main results sort of informally and then come to the formal, uh, come to sort of some of the ideas here. Informally, under standard assumptions, um, uh, meaning uh, the, some reason, uh, the tasks are diverse, some assumptions on the uh, sub-Gaussianity of the noise, actually we just assume Gaussian noise in this case, um, and so on. We can argue that mammal anil and the first order analogs actually recover the column space exponentially fast when, uh, when run on task populations. Second, anil and first order anil require the number of, if you do a finite sample analysis, the sample complexity is scales in this manner. So let's uh, un uh, unpack this expression. The samples per task, if you didn't do any shared learning, would be order, would be order D samples per task. In the best case, if, if somehow B star was amortized completely out, you would get order K samples per task. So what MAML and L, what we're able to prove is the following. The order D is scaled as D by N, where N is the number of tasks. So this is saying there's a nice amortization going on. Okay. Um, and so if you've got a large number of tasks, this thing is amortized out completely to become an order one quantity times K cube. So ideally, you'd like K here. What we're able to prove is K, uh, K cube. Okay. So, but you are getting a much smaller number of tasks, meaning that 
the shared representation um, is being learned and this, the, the cost for doing that is being amortized across these stars. And the key, as we'll see, is that the head adaptation in, in each training step, you're doing a head adaptation. And it turns out that is the key to improve representations in all directions. So these are some of the first results to show that uh, mammal and animal indeed provably learn effective representations. So let's get to why this is happening. Recall those equations I quickly went through. Um, what mammal and anil roughly do the following. There's a head adaptation, meaning at time t, if you've got a model, you need to adapt it by taking a gradient step to get the personalized model for each task i. And then there's an outer loop where you take a gradient step after you evaluate these models on this part, uh, after you evaluate these personalized models. If you rewrite this, it turns out you can, you effectively get the following for the first order anil equations. You get the, effectively you get the following equations. I'm not going to go to the algebra of it. It says the following. Suppose at time t, the body of the model was bt. b star is the true model. Then effectively these equations do the following. At time t plus one, bt is multiplied by some matrix. B star is multiplied by a different matrix. And BT plus one is given by BT times this, uh, by the linear combination of these two uh, terms. Let's unpackage these terms. Start here. WTI is the adapted head. So WT, so how did you get WTI? You took WT, which was the model at time T. And for task I, you said you're going to take WT and subtract some personalized gradient. So it's a personalized head model for task I. So WTI, W2. So this one, this is a vector, transpose of the vector. So this is a rank one matrix. So it's just this vector times that vector. Okay. So that's what this is. This is an average of all these rank one matrices. Suppose that, so WT is common. Suppose that the, this average matrix is full rank. That basically means that each, each particular task has changed this head in some manner such that they are sort of pointing in different directions. Uh, these, the, the, the WTs, it started with WT and it made it WTI and they're sort of pointing in different directions, which means this matrix would be full rank. If this is full rank, I is, a, I is an identity matrix. So this would be a full rank matrix. What does this mean? It says that you look at the BT, which was what I had the representation at time T and multiplied by this matrix, which is I minus some full rank matrix, which means that I'm pulling energy out along all directions of uh, all directions in the subspace, which means I am essentially removing energy from BT in all directions. And now let's look at the second term. Suppose that this is also full rank. So again, for the same reasoning, the, suppose that WTIs all point in different directions. W stars are the true model, way, uh, true heads, and they're also say diverse. Then this also would be a full rank matrix. Then what you're doing essentially in, in, in by this set of equations is saying, I have a particular model. I'm going to take energy out in all directions from that model and instead add energy of add energy in all directions from the true model. So now you can see why things should geometrically converge fast. You're essentially, if these two are removing, this is removing energy enough and this is adding energy fast enough, then this adaptation should lead to this one exponentially fast converging to this one. So head, both head adaptation and task diversity is, are critical. Task diversity is critical to make sure that this is full rank, Head adaptation is critical to make sure that this is full rank. What happens in Anil? Suppose you don't adapt the model for each task. We had WTI. It, what instead you have is WT. Because every task is just using the mod. The model at time T was BT WT. Each task is just using these. So there is no inner adaptation. So what is happening essentially here is that this is just a vector times a vector. So this is a rank one matrix. So this is not full rank. 
this is rank k minus one. Okay. Look at this one. This is common. So if this is common, I can pull this out. So this is just some vector times a vector. So this is just rank one. So what I have is rank k minus one here and rank one here. So what is this the standard average risk minimization doing? It is taking energy out of BT in at least one less, um, not in all directions, because there's only rank k minus one, it's missing some direction. And it's adding energy in at, it, in, in at most one direction, okay? Which means it is not clear that this thing is moving closer and closer to this. It could, if this, if this, uh, if this energy somehow over time, they weigh this one points, points in various different directions, but it's not at all clear in this case that this one and this one will get close to each other because the representation can only move closer to column space of B star in one direction each iteration. Each iteration. In fact, we will show a counter example saying that this iteration can actually get stuck. So this is really the key takeaway. Mammal works because it is this adaptation is learning the column space of B star geometrically fast. Of course, this is just a very handy -heavy argument I gave you here. It's not clear. It, it crucially dependent on the fact that the head adaptation is such that the point in you start with any vector wt and this one points in all directions um, after just one step of gradient descent, uh, you know, head adaptation, and it has enough energy to actually this one to be full rank and nicely conditioned so that this one can geometrically get to this. So this again, I just put the same figure. The implication of that is if you if you just do the average risk minimization, that the distance isn't going down at all. Whereas any of these, uh, once you have had a head adaptation, exponentially fast convergence happen. Um, I have about 20 minutes. I'll spend a few minutes talking about uh, a little bit more details about this, and then I'll switch to federated learning. We saw that really the reason why um, mammal, thing, mammal or actually uh, anil, mammal or any of these are working is that there is uh, the head adaptation is happening and the adapted heads are sufficiently diverse. Diverse basically meaning they evenly spread across the low dimensional subspace arc. If you sort of unpackage the, the equations of the head adaptation, it is just the head minus one gradient step uh, for, uh, for, the, for task i. And if you simplify that further, you can write this, you can decompose it into two parts. One part, which does not have any i dependent term, meaning for all tasks i, this part is exactly the same. There is no i in this. And another part, which has, a task dependent part, I part in it. So if you want this to be diverse across all tasks I, you need to make sure that this term is small compared to this term. Okay. If this is very large and this is negligible, then all these WTIs will be essentially this, they'll all point in the same direction. And so you'll not have diversity. So this is the one that you need to show is, much, is bigger than this. So one way to show that this is bigger than this is the following. So I've just, uh, Put the same equation here. That this part should be um, should be small. This matrix should uh, uh, some norm of this matrix should be small. Okay. Um, this vector has low small energy, where, whereas the singular value of this is lower bounded, so that this is large enough. If you satisfy all these three conditions, then you can argue that uh, WTI is um, a, are sufficiently diverse. Again, these are not necessary. Because one could argue all you care is this to be small compared to this. This is just one way of that happening. But this is what we are going to show, that these three things simultaneously happen. And that is why, um, really, um, this, this algorithm works. Um, I just want to talk a couple of minutes on uh, principal angle distance. So really, what we care about is um, tracking how two subspaces are close to each other. With, ang with lines, the angle t, so we know that uh, if you have this, if you, as long as theta goes to zero, then these lines are aligned with each other. So we need the equivalent of that for planes. 
And one way of doing this is something called the principal angle distance. They only take a, they, we can go to the, I'm not going to go to the equations of it, but the geometry is hopefully clear that if the planes are fully aligned, then this distance should be equal to zero. And if they are, uh, and can become large uh, as they become orthogonal. So now I want to come back to the main theorem. The formal result is the principal angle distance between the representation at time t and uh, the true ground truth representation goes down geometrically fast. So this is some quantity less than one um, uh, by choosing alpha and beta correspond to the step size parameters when you are doing the mammal uh, gra uh, gradient descent adaptations. Um, and under conditions that are sort of somewhat different for each one of these algorithms, Anil is almost no inner loop, first order mammal is uh, uh, you know, removing the Hessian, mammal is the original algorithm itself and so on. Um, under different conditions, you can show uh, this geometric convergence. And there are also some finite sample results as I alluded to earlier. Um, I have 15 minutes. So I'm going to use that 15 minutes to not even talk about the proof of this, but I want to talk about, I want to switch to federated learning. All I want to say is the proof of this is quite is quite tricky. It involves a sort of uh, six-way induction uh, um, where you need to track six different things. One corresponding to how well conditioned the representation is, how the global head, how the energy in the heads are, how dive, um, whether they learned how quickly the learned subspace is sort of converging to B star and so on. Um, and the six way, this is a sort of graphical illustration of the six way induction. There are six induction hypotheses and you need to show that that, that moves forward in time. Um, I'm not going to get into the details. I'm happy to chat about this offline because I'm, I have only 15 minutes left. I want to talk about uh, uh, federated learning as well. The real takeaway is that the inner loop update of the representations um, are, are need, uh, yeah, inner loop updates of the head is really needed for for essentially coming up with the diversity condition to make sure that uh, mammal and anil learn these representations okay um you can look at more details the paper was in icml last year so you can look at that or uh, i'm happy to chat about this offline as well all right so i want to now switch start switch focus and talk about federated learning so what is the connection between mammal and federated learning? We'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But first, me, first, let me just quickly describe federated learning. So go back to the original arm uh, average risk minimization problem. Okay. Forget the mammal objective of fine tuning. Suppose I don't care about fine tuning, uh, the model for each, uh, uh, for each task. I want to first just train a model given the original last function. What would you do? You've got task i, you've got um, a, lo a loss function associated with it, and just want to minimize the average loss, and that's your going to be a model. So meaning during training, in MAML, what we were doing is we were doing theta minus grad f phi of theta. We are not doing any of that anymore. We're just going back to the basics. You train such a model, and then what you do is, of course, during deployment, you fine tune this model using a few SGD steps, you get a new model, you test this model. We already saw in the first part, this doesn't work very well. It just uh, they, because this model may not have learned the, the ground truth representation. So there's no reason to, under, uh, to presume that it will generalize well to a new task. If you look at this, but nevertheless, let's just think through this. This is just, uh, this is, I want to learn such a model. How would I do this? Well, one way, one, one way would be through a distributed SGD. So suppose that each one of these tasks, this motivation comes from the fact that each one of these tasks have their own data. They may be on a different client. So this motivates sort of a federated way of doing this, solving this optimization problem. Meaning um, you start with a model theta t, you broadcast the model to all the clients. Each client is a task. Each client takes a gradient step. Uh, with respect to their loss function, sends the model back. This one, the server updates it. So effectively, the upgrade uh, updated model is nothing but uh, the update is simply the average of all of the uh, whatever it got. So it is just uh, take your model, 
take a gradient step per, per task and average it. And that's your new model. And then bounce it back, update, go back and forth. So this is exactly ARM. All I'm talking about is a distributed implementation to actually solve this optimization problem. If I was solving this centralized, I would take a gradient step and uh, you know I, I would take a, uh, at every every time I have a model, I'll take one gradient step, get a new model, take a new gradient step, take and get a new model and so on. Because this is uh, this objective function is summation, I can equally well distribute this function across these various clients and nothing changes except as an implementation. Okay, so this is distributed stochastic gradient descent, very well understood. What is federated learning? Federated learning says, hey, look at this prop, this what's going on between the server and the clients. What we said is the model is sent down, one gradient step is done here, sent up. But this is really communication intensive because there's a lot of communication going back and forth. Instead, let's do the following. Let's not do one gradient step at each time here. Let each client do several, let's say how gradient steps, two, three, maybe even 10 gradient steps. So locally it does 10 gradient steps, sends the model back to the server, okay? And the server averages just as before. So the only difference from previous thing is, instead of each client doing one gradient step, it's doing several gradient steps. The advantage, of course, is the number of communication rounds is much less than the number of updates because now I can have many, many updates of the model here, maybe maybe five or 10 updates of the model for every one communication. The issue is that if the clients don't have the same data distribution, what's called what people call data heterogeneity, then these models are drifting away from each other when you're doing multiple steps. And when you average it back, it is not clear what exactly is happening. This argument that, you know, this, I want to solve this loss function, and this is just as the standard SGD, uh, standard distributed SGD is just an implementation of that, of, of solving the original loss function is no longer true, because there are multiple updates going on here, there's model drift, and averaging, now the one to one correspondence is broken. And people have known that, and there's a lot of literature on this from the optimization point of view. This is model drift or local drift. And the algorithm I talked about, which is called FedAv, which, which is a well-known algorithm, federated averaging, does not solve the global objective in the data heterogeneous setting. There's uh, many, many papers which show this. And so to control this so-called local drift issue in federated averaging, um, there are many proposals in literature. But if you step back, you can, uh, you can say, hey, the federated learning has done some modification of many local uh, steps before you are averaging. You can look at this as saying, implicitly, I have changed the objective function to something else. This problem is no longer solving the original objective function. Because of the difference in implementation, it is solving, this has become something else which is not well clear anymore. And that's that's, and the solution to that new problem is not matching the solution to this problem. And people have spent a lot of effort trying to understand how to get rid of that difference between the two. But maybe the new problem is actually good. If you look at if you look at uh, generalization performance, not the optimization performance, which is what we talked about here, but how this the federated learning model works on new tasks. Here is what we realize. So here is the x-axis is the number of fine-tuning samples for a new task, and y-axis is the accuracy. If you look at distributed SGD, which is nothing but federated averaging, but just one step of local update, right? Um, the, the basic algorithm, you send the model down, you do one gradient update at the client, send it back up. So the performance with for various, uh, for various, this is the performance, generalization performance, meaning a model was trained on 80 classes for C400 and fine tuned on new clients from 20 new classes of C400. So uh, in, the, in the generalization performance, this is the SGD performance, whereas this is federated averaging, which seems to be performing much better than distributed SGD. If you ask for even out of uh, even more um, 
sort of drastic generalization questions, meaning the model is trained on CIFAR 100, but fine-tuned on new clients for CIFAR 10. Again, similar things happen. That distributed SGD has this performance, higher is better, whereas, my, uh, whereas uh, federated averaging has much higher performance. And we have normalized it so that it's fair. The number of samples trained is the same for either one of these cases. So what is, what is going on is that from a generalization point of view, federated averaging seems to be performing much better than distributed SGD. And the motivation for federated averaging was not anything to do with generalization or performance on new tasks. It was simply a more communication efficient algorithm. So let's see what is going on. Okay. So the question is, motivated by our mammal question, we can ask, is federated averaging actually learning representations? So here is a plot which we, we ran. The x-axis is the model layer. The y-axis is some distance score between mod, the model before and after fine tuning. This is with distributed SGD. Smaller means there's more model change. So as you go, as you go deeper and deeper into the network, the, uh, the before and after fine tuning models are very different. Whereas with federated averaging, it is different, but much less. Meaning this is hinting that maybe fed average is actually trying to learn representations because of doing multiple steps of local update. And we look at uh, exactly the same multitask linear regression setting as the, uh, the mammal setting, meaning the task I has ground, uh, ground truth theta star I, there's a linear regression problem for each task. Uh, there's a common low dimensional subspace. Um, all that's different across these tasks are the head, but the body is the same. So again, we are just using this as a vehicle to try to understand what is going on here. <clears throat> and what we can show is the following. If the number of local updates is at least two, then federated averaging recovers the column space of B star exponentially fast when run on population tasks. So the key insight is very similar to what, what we talked about in the mammal case. If you unpackage the federated averaging um, uh, equations, you get something more complicated than a mammal one. But what we can argue is that the, because you are doing two steps of updates locally, it turns out that's enough to essentially mimic the, a diversity condition. The two steps of updates at each task make the heads drift far, off, far enough away from the starting model such that effectively the update is such that um, you're removing energy in all directions from BT and adding energy in all directions to B star. So, the, so this is sort of a local update and task diversity, again, does something which Mammal was doing. Mammal was doing it by essentially explicitly engineering the loss function to do this. Federated averaging is implicitly doing it because of model drift. And indeed, if you set tau equal to one, which is you don't, you don't do multiple steps of uh, model drift at each client, you just, you just do one step, the usual distributed SGD and average. What we can show is that you, it's possible that you do not learn representations. More formally, you can show that there exists a B. So this, uh, you can show an instance for which that model will not converge. There exists some model for, if you give me any, any delta, and any time horizon, then I can construct a model B star such that if you start with an initial condition B naught, uh, which is delta far away from the model B star, then after time T, it will still re remain at least 0.7 delta away, meaning distributed SGD cannot guarantee recovery to ground truth. So the, if, if, the technical if you didn't get all the technical details, I'd really like to sort of highlight this one picture. You're looking from the optimization point of view, distributed gradient descent indeed finds a stationary point of the original problem, whereas federated, federated average does not. So if you look at communication rounds versus sort of the norm of the gradient of the global loss, um, distributed gradient descent, the norm goes down. What does this mean? That means I am finding a stationary point of the original optimization problem or quote unquote, I'm solving the optimization problem under some, if, if there's a unique solution and so on. Yeah. Um, so things are working. Whereas federated averaging is doing something weird, right? There's model drift at each point. There's some heterogeneity across tasks. So there's no reason to believe that it's actually finding, it's solving the original optimization problem. And that's what it's saying. It's reaching an error flow. It, this is not going down. So 
DSGD is solving the problem I wanted to solve. Federated averaging does not. But if you look at it from the generalization point of view, okay, then the picture completely switches. Distributed SGD may not generalize. The generalization performance, this is the, the representation error is staying fixed. Whereas with federated averaging, the representation uh, error in measured in terms of principal angular distance actually going down exponentially fast. The takeaway is that even though you're not solving the, the optimization problem, the ARM optimization problem, the change in algorithm implicitly change the loss function. And this implicit change is essentially giving enough diversity to actually generalize and solve the problem and find a representation that's actually transferable. So you can, you, so with, uh, and so really, if you st step back, this is, this was our goal for finding the model. The goal of a model is not to solve an optimization problem, but to generalize well for new tasks. And so from that perspective, federated averaging implicitly is doing this, this better generalization. Of course, these are all linear models. The question is what happens with nonlinear models? Um, but, uh, I, uh, um, uh, but and this is current ongoing work. But I'd like to leave it that that uh, um, that really adaptivity and local diversity is allowing representation learning, which will allow sort of fine tuned uh, performance, which will fit to a new task. And these are the sort of papers that are associated with it. The first one was in ICML last year, and the second one was in Europe's last year. Um, I thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, so uh, one uh, quick question. So you mentioned about learning the uh, uh, the B matrix, right? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. In terms of the angle between the uh, the learned and the original optimal uh, B. What about the Ws? Uh, is, Good. Is there... Excellent question. So when you when you care of when you want a new so suppose somebody gave you the B star matrix, okay. Then when you go to a new task, what you should do is to just throw away the W because it, there is no connection among the Ws. Ws are just arbitrary different vectors in the in that uh, subspace. And then you should just, I, if you knew this is what is going on, you just take the B, B matrix. On the neural network example, you just take the body of the model, model, freeze the body, then strip out the head and retrain the head. This is what you would do. So that is what fine tuning is essentially doing. So. Even if you are learning to solve an optimization problem, you want to learn a B matrix, B star and a W star matrix. The W star is the B star matrix would be maybe the original true planted representation. And W star is some average head, which is good across all these tasks. Okay. If you are, if that is indeed the goal, the optimization is the correct problem. But if generalization is the goal, which is I want to find a B star and W star, but I don't really care what W star I'm learning because I'm going to anyway throw it away, then, um, then the problem completely changes. And that's really why you see this, dif this difference completely from an optimization and generalization perspective. Okay, and, and one more question. So if you, if you add some uh, regularization term to the cost function, original cost function, where you, uh, where you focus purely on optimization, right? And not on generalization. So you take that cost, you add some other term, and that should give you this, uh, uh, this very good question. Uh, mem memory, right? Uh, in some sense, uh, or um, it's not a regular. So that is mammal is not quite a regularization. It's a fine tuning. So if you regularize, so what people have done. Uh, so you ask a good question. Can you regularize to get mammal? What mammal is doing is not regularization, but actually a uh, fine. So regularization would maybe add some norm of theta or something like that, some model square, L2 norm, L1 norm, whatever. This would be the kind of regularization. What MAML is doing is adapting this model in a task specific manner. It's not a global, it's not a, it's not a global regularizer. It is, it is basically saying, I'm not evaluating the function of the model, I'm evaluating the function of a perturbed model. What regularization would, could potentially do is to take the model and try to force the optimization to not drift away too much from 
even though I'm doing many fine tuning steps, maybe I can regularize to make sure that these fine tuning steps um, do not change the objective too much. And people have tried those kinds of things. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but uh, yeah, yeah, right, right. So, but but the uh, the regularization that you're telling is for a single task. I'm 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 saying that if we can somehow find a term which captures uh, regularization across different tasks, then maybe that could be a. Uh, so, if you that... regularize, good question, good question. So. If you have the same regularization for across all tasks, that what that is not that would be any of these kinds of things, potentially. What Mammal could think of doing if you do a Taylor C expansion on Fi of theta minus delta, is you're doing a task specific regularization maybe or something like that. Do you see what I mean? Because yeah. Mammal is yeah. So then you you but it's a different regularizer per task and. Uh, maybe that would get you this kind of uh, this diversity but really what you want is to ensure that there's a diversity of object there's a that the inner loop gives you enough diversity to allow you to explore that subspace well enough to actually learn that subspace and that is not happening when you have a single wt um, within each iteration yeah got it thanks Well, thank you very much for your time and attention. Um, thanks. I'll stop sharing, I guess. Uh, thank you, Professor Sanjay, for an informative talk. Um, is there any more questions? Yeah, uh, then I guess, uh, uh, thank you all. Uh, have a great day. Thank you.